This video is about a village in Dorset called Oakford Fitzpain. I'm going to take you on a virtual tour telling you about my father's memories, my memories, some family history and a bit of history about the village itself. We will start off here. Before I start, let me tell you a bit about what's down this leading in road. This road comes from Shillingstone and there used to be an autocross enthusiast who lived down there and he had a track for cars to go around. There's also a Wonderland caravan site and there used to be a mixing tower on it for cement and the lorries would come with their drums and fill up. But before this, there was a brickworks, and it was for the local Pitt Rivers estate. My grandfather used to work here temporarily. Um, but behind it, there used to be clay pits that had filled up with water. And my father and his friends used to climb the metal railings and go and find common newts and great crested newts in the ponds. A bit further up is Little Lane and my father and his uh, friends used to join this lane by walking through the wreck and then they'd walk down to a river in Shillingstone um, where Haywood's Bridge is and that's where all the families would bathe. Then a bit further up there was the pumping station and this was fed by a spring that was in Pound Lane but the area between Pound Lane and the pumping station was filled with watercress. Now on to where we are. And this entrance goes to chicken sheds. Um, this has always been the case since the milk factory closed down. But there used to be an entrance up on that corner which is called Downs Corner. And the reason it's called Downs Corner is because of the name of the fields. And I'm sure the locals know all the field names even to this day. But this original entrance up here used to lead to a piggery. Um, and the pigs were fed on whey from the milk factory. Uh, there used to be a sign there saying Wessex herd of British saddlebacks. Um, and they were bought, bought up in sty in sheds. Um, and then let out onto the fields. Now these next houses and bungalow are built in the garden of the big thatched house which is situated just before the bend up near the church. It was in this big house that carpenters lived and because my great grandfather was also a carpenter in his latter years he used to help out building the coffins Further up, on the corner here, you'll see now it's just a drain cover. But here used to be where water flowed and the villagers used to rinse their clothes here, obviously long be before my father's time. Now, going round into Back Lane, just around the corner here is a gate into the churchyard and you'll see this path going across here used to be um, an old road and to the right there used to be an orchard and two cottages just to the left of the lich gate from this view and in 1910 they demolished those cottages and the church took on the land because it needed more um, graveyard space. Just opposite over here is now an allotment. There you can see but previous it used to be used for rearing pigs. We go a little bit down Pound Lane. Here is the old Methodist Chapel um, it's been used for a water, 
waterboard storage but now there's a cottage built on the side which hasn't been updated by Google yet. Further down on the left, I won't go down, but in uh, in the 1800s there was a smithy and you can still see the remains today. At the end of Pound Lane it leaps round and joins the track that goes up over Merridge on Oakford Hill. Um, at one point this was blocked and no longer used as a lane and the whole area became covered in primroses and as children um, my father and his friends used to go and collect primroses and take them to the lady who was in charge of decorating the church and she'd give them a few pence for the primroses. Back to the beginning of Pound Lane and looking up Back Lane. Um, we're not able to go up there because Google Earth won't allow it. This section of greenery that we're looking at now is a car park, although you can't see it here in this old image. But just up back lane on the left is a field that used to have part of it made into allotments. And the school used to have a couple of plots on the allotments. As a child, my father would take the tools up there with the school children um, about once a week. They'd tend the allotments and then in their maths lessons they'd work out expenses for things like buying seeds and income from mothers that bought the produce. A little further up on the right my grandfather said there used to be a builder's yard and a building for killing animals. If you go to the end of the lane and turn left, you go on to what was Back Hill Lane, the old road that went up over Oakford Hill. Further up this lane, on the left hand side, there's a chalk pit. Um, this was used partly as a dump, but originally as a um, place for making lime. And then a little further still on the right was a string of chalk pits. There used to be ridges in the ground to warn walkers that they were approaching a steep drop. My dad said this was always a good place to play. Further up where it joins the new road that goes over Oakford Hill, you can see bumps and hollows in the ground and this was where they took gravel because there used to be gravel just above the underlying chalk um, which they used for road building. All over the top of Oakford Hill, which was unfenced at the time, was a considerable area of gorse and heather. It was tradition on bonfire night that this area was set alight with torches. Apparently it was a good sight from the village. We've come round to the other side of the church now and this is the church where the vicar took the um, Sunday school children up the bell tower to see the bells and the bell wasn't trigged up properly and it swung down and killed him and the clapper hit my father on the head. The children ran down screaming and the villagers heard the screaming and realised what had happened. When I attended this church with my gran, it had pews inside, but these have since been taken out and replaced with movable chairs. Further up the lane, we come to a footpath, and if you go up that, it joins an old historic route that goes to Oakford Hill in one direction and Dorchester in the other. I used to walk my dog up there when he was alive. And this is the village hall that used to be, and may still be, called the reading room. It's been greatly extended in recent years. This area where we're standing now is called Green Haze, and it's an area where a lot of outdoor events used to be held, but now they're mostly held down on the wreck. Going back down the road now, And here we come to what was the old coach house 
for the rectory and next to it is the rectory. Just inside the garden walls where these garages are now built there were conker trees and that was always a good source of conkers if the vicar was out for my father and his friends. On the lawn of the rectory there used to be gatherings. One of these gatherings was the Band of Hope March Finish. Further on round the corner and we come to probably the oldest houses in the village. They're dated from just before the, ha the farmhouse opposite which is called St Lowe's. This house was built in 1638. If we go along this road, this wall here used to have a glazed window just the other side of it and if you looked through it you could see um, all bike parts. My dad wasn't sure how you bought the bike parts but presumably he had to go round to the cottage. This in the middle of the road is the old schoolhouse which used to be used as the school before the school was built in 1873. And next to it is the village cross which no longer remains, only the base, but this used to be the village green. A little way up this road and you come to a metal door and a wall which is the back of the rectory garden. past Wisteria Cottage and just up here you'll notice there's a extension on the front of this house and this used to be a sweet shop that also had groceries um, and then an electrician moved in and turned it into an electrical shop temporarily. A bit further up and that's the path coming from Green Haze. On the left, over the hedge in a garden, there used to be a saw pit and a builder's. And just in here, set back from the road, there used to be a building made out of corrugated iron and this was the temperance hall and my dad remembers as a kid there used to be parties there and magic lantern shows. Then just on the left here there used to be pigs next to a bungalow. You'll notice that this road is in a cutting um, and this was done at the around the turn of the century, so in about 1900. Just on the left here you'll see the pound and this replaced the old pound down in Pound Lane. In 2002 the walls were re rebuilt um, and this pound used to be used to hold animals overnight but my father only remembers a council lorry being parked there. Um, as children because the walls were steep it used to be a fun place to climb around. Opposite the pound there was a brick building that held water 
and it used to release water down to standpipes in the village alongside the road. It was probably fed by a spring and this was before the reservoir was built. The reservoir is up Oakford Hill Road. I won't go up there. And if you look out to the right of it, you'll see where they used to practice um, shooting. They used to have humps about every 100 yards. And they'd shoot from these to targets at the foot of the hill. There was a small railway line of a few yards, which my dad thinks may have been used for moving targets. As a child, he used to go there with others, digging the bullets out of the chalk, even though they were splattered. If you go straight up this road that we're stood looking up now, you'll come to a farm which wasn't there originally, but there used to be a lane, Sandy Lane. And this is a lane that my father and his family used to walk down often on Sundays. And at the beginning of this lane was a sand pit. Further along this road, is where the gypsies used to stop their vardos. They used to stop a couple of days and come round the village selling clothes pegs that they made from split carved bits of wood with a bit of tin tacked on to hold it together. And when I was young, I remember a vardo and my grand pointing it out to me on the Oakford Hill Road on the lay-by up there. Now turning to go down Higher Street or Upper Street as it's also known. These doors just to the left are a open cart shed and if we go round to the other side we'll see the barn slash stable. Over on the main building there used to be a lean-to that was thatched and it held the cider making equipment and the barrels and it was here that my grandfather used to make cider with a couple of others. The next house was where the garage once stood. In the yard <coughs> there used to be petrol and repairs and then a house on the right hand side of the yard. The next house is where the lady lived who my father used to take primroses to, as mentioned earlier. She dealt with the Sunday school and decorating the church. Here there used to be um, lots of cow stalls and barns, a big farm behind the house, but now there's new houses built here. This house here is the old New Inn. It closed down many years ago but it was only very very small inside. There was a farm behind this next house as well and it used to bend round to the right and join an entrance in Lower Street. And this house has a metal plate on the side of it where the um, chimney was. My dad can remember when he was young seeing the fire engine squirting water in through the metal opening. Because it was thatched and there were wooden beams resting near the chimney and in those days wood was being burnt which caused a lot of soot, they had to be very careful um, about fires. This terrace of thatched hou houses was used for the staff social and offices and storerooms for the factory workers. This 
This is the remaining house after a fire burnt down the house next to it. There was also a pub just on the corner here called the Nine Elms and that's uh, thought by my dad to have been burnt down by the fire as well. It was around this area that my great grandfather lived with his mother who ran a bakery at the time. This entrance is the entrance to where the factory was. Now it leads to an estate of houses. It was once a cheese factory. The milk was taken around the back of the factory and unloaded from tractor trailers from farms when in 10 gallon churns and later from tankers. The milk churns were put in a steam steriliser after emptying and farmers took back empty churns. The milk was then heat treated and went through pipes to a building at the front facing the road but way back in the yard and put into thousand gallon vats and heated with starter added and tested till right, the right acidity. It was then drained into other vats where the whey was drained off for the pigs at the piggery and the curds were stacked and worked many times before they were ready to be cut into small cubes and weighed into moulds either 56 pounds for a cheese or 40 pounds for blocks as is now common. Every year some truckles which are 10 pound cheeses were made usually for Christmas requirements of shops. The cheese was put in presses to squeeze out more whey. Same again the following day then put into cold stores for at least 18 months. There were two stores on site but also another in an old chapel building about seven miles away. The workers could have their own metal can filled with fresh fresh milk each day and my grandfather used to bring his home at lunchtime on his bike. My dad isn't sure whether this had to be paid for but certainly with cheese when purchased the amount was rounded down to the nearest pound in weight when calculating the cost. A limited amount of butter was made, but this was from churns of cream from Ireland, which arrived at Shillingstone station, train station until it closed. The factory was originally Edward Phillips and Son, then Malmesbury and Parsons, with connections in Bournemouth, and then taken over by Unigate, who promptly closed it after about a year, my father thinks. He remembers that Moundsbury and Parsons had a Christmas party for all the workers' kids down at Bournemouth, which was pretty good. After this, it was followed by Webb and Webb, a chicken factory, and this is where an aunt of mine worked for many years. My memory of the chicken factory is the smell that pervaded the village. In latter years... There was demand for a solution to this and the factory put a large chimney that lifted the smell above the village. My grandfather and my father both worked at the factory when it was a cheese factory but my grandfather also worked for a man and his son that lived in the following house. Just down here. They provided equipment and workers um, to do farm work and this ammonite that's in the side of their house used to just be propped up against the base um, but then a lorry smashed into the house and when it was rebuilt they built the ammonite into the house. Just there you can see the old prison door. The cell is now blocked up and built into the cottage itself.
this house used to have a rick in the yard and a threshing machine and there was all the dust and straw um, grain sacks and people looking out for mice that usually lived at the bottom of the ricks. My dad only remembers the farmyard being used for a rick of corn sheaves as the main farm with cows um, was at the end of Dark Knoll Lane which will be mentioned later and the farmhouse there had burnt down years before. Where this pavement is, there didn't used to be a pavement, but there used to be an open stream and the stream crossed under the road and then past the shop, uh, past St Lowe's farm that we mentioned earlier and around the church corner and down to the mill. Right, on to Lower Street, which is also known as Duck Street. This next house had a double gate to the yard on the side and there was a massive dung heap in the yard and the man who owned the place had a board ramp up which he wheeled his wheelbarrow to make it higher. There was a cow stall at the end of the yard and he had a Dutch barn built to the left of it and it was behind there that my dad slipped and gashed his leg on the corrugated iron sheet and it was so deep it left a really large scar, um, which he still has to this day. Um, he was put in a bath chair and wheeled home. And um, the man that lived there, he used to have a horse and cart, which he used as his, his fields were just outside the village on the common road. He also bottled and sold milk to some of the village. Um, and he had a milk cooler in a room by the back door but my dad doesn't think that there was any sterilizing he put it in bottles with cardboard milk bottle tops they had a long garden with um, many gooseberries along the wall and the doctor used to use the front room as a surgery one morning a week and he came over from child oakford it was also in this house just in that room, that the one of the first TVs in the village was there. And my father used to go and watch TV there sometimes. The next building is Strezza House. Again, it had a long garden with orchards stretching up to the factory. And my father could walk up the farmyard next door and through the top of the garden and he and others used to scrum apples from there. This new house next door. This was built at the front end of Old Stables and the coach house of Strezza House. And then next... This is the farm entrance that I mentioned previously that the farm in Upper Street bent round to join. There used to be an old cart shed on the left of the entrance and that's only gone very recently and all the entrances had little bridges. I'll pause here and show a picture so you can see. This image dates from the 1900s. It shows where the open stream flowed and the bridges where the entrances were. A little bit further along the road and we come to this house. The man who lived here used to play the flute and he used to have musical evenings with my great grandfather, who played the violin. Behind there were also barns and outbuildings and there was an old building by this that was demolished um, and this was an ale house. These council houses here, they replaced some old chalk cottages that were dilapidated and demolished. Just up here, we'll see The stream is still open. 
My memory of this grassy area was us playing rounders here and when we broke the cricket bat, because we didn't have a rounders bat, um, with just by hitting the ball. Also, I remember the way my gran used to run like a youngster even though she was in her latter years. Just down here is the old chapel. And I remember this being converted into a house when I was about a teenager, so around the millennium. We're now further down the road and this is where the brook runs and there used to be a ford here before my dad's time and if you go up the track to the left there's still a ford there today. I'm not going to go further on down this road but I'll talk about what's up it. A little bit further up on the left you come to Malt House Cottages where as the name suggests um, they were part of brewing long before my father's time and my grandfather said there was a killing shed just behind the cottages at one time. A bit further on and there's a track on the left which leads up to a house. Um, the track's about two to three hundred yards very stony and rutted um, and the house is called Abergavenny. This was where my family lived. My father and his eldest sister lived here for the first few months of their lives before they moved down to the new council estate when it was built down in the village. Um, but my grandfather and his parents had lived there for many years with few amenities um, and a bit remote from the village. And my grandfather's dad had a donkey and trap. And we have a photo of him on it near the house. My dad thinks the donkey was called Sam. Going back to the road, if you go up further, um, you'll reach the common, which was all open with gorse, but is now fenced off into fields. And you'll also come to where my gran worked in the land army. This was where she met my grandfather because he also worked on the farm. Up on the right there's another area where gravel was dug out for the roads. There was also a cottage down in the woods at the bottom of the common and my grandfather says a lady used to brew beer and sell it here. I will just go a little further along the road. Where this garden is is the site of the old garage that used to repair cars and farm equipment. This is the new garage, Forge Garage, and as the name would suggest, it's sited where the original forge was. My dad remembers the forge being brick with a tile roof in quite a poor state, and he remembers horses being shooed outside. When the new garage was put there, two new petrol pumps were installed. We're on Dark Knoll Lane now and successive owners of this place had cows in stalls and in fields. They lived very near the brook and water had a drop of about three to four feet from under the bridge and made a nice splashing noise. My father remembers a pair of grey wagtails always nesting in the ivy and undergrowth on the side of the bridge. There was a duck pond in the front of the yard of this farm and the owner was another one with a horse and cart which would quite often be seen outside the pub waiting for him. My father believes the horse was killed and certainly some pigs when there was a fire in the thatched barns which ran alongside the lane just by the house. The fire brigade came but my father doesn't think that the animals were saved. 
He remembers walking up the lane the following morning and the hose pipes were still up the lane from the brook at the bottom where they'd pumped the water from as there were no fire hydrants in those days to tap into. As it had been a very frosty night, the pipes were frozen hard. About another half mile up the lane is another farm and the house burnt down there too. They had several fields that they farmed and numerous cow stalls and barns and my father remembers swallows always around in the summer. Back to where Dark Knoll joins Lower Street facing towards the village. These cottages here are called Netherway Cottages and they were named after the field Netherway which was there. One of my aunts lived in them. Here there was a farm gate into a field and my dad remembers on a couple of occasions a large tent appeared where you could go for what he believes was some sort of Christian singing or something similar. It may have been linked to the chapel just up the road. Now we're going to enter the council estate which my father and his family moved to after Abergavenny. They originally lived in a larger of the houses but when the children grew up, they moved to one of the smaller ones to allow another family to use that house. This was where I used to visit with my family as a child. When we visited my gran, there were always sweets waiting for us on top of the fridge from the lovely neighbour next door. All us kids used to go round to say thank you. I think she used to give sweets to the village children as well. Where this new estate now sits, there used to be an allotment and my grandfather used to have one of the allotments. When we were children, we used to walk along the side of these allotments and over the fields behind to get to the brook. We used to build dams down there and skim stones in a pool. One of my memories is walking along the brook and not seeing an invisible ledge that went down and going down into the water quite deep. It was very cold. When this new estate was built, we had to take a new route through the houses to get to the brook. We were also encouraged as children to go out walking around the village in the evening when it got dark because there were no street lights. Where we lived there were street lights so it was a different experience for us. Here you may be able to see there's just one apple tree remaining. There used to be three when I was a child. Now I believe they've all been removed. I remember my gran being proud of them because she felt the council couldn't touch them. But I think in the end it came down to the children throwing apples and that was why they were removed. But I'm not sure whether this is true or not. Originally it was an orchard. There were many orchards around Oakford for making cider. I haven't mentioned all of them. There was an apple tree planted after my grandfather died, in memory of him. Whether it still exists, I don't know. Back to where Mary Gardens joins Lower Street, facing towards the pub. These council houses on the left replaced older buildings. But further down... It was either this house or the next house that my grandfather said was a butcher's. This cottage is where my dad used to do gardening and wash the car to earn pocket money.
My gran also worked for the lady who lived here, and in later years, when I was young, she worked for a different lady who I think lived the other side of this now semi. When the lady went away, my gran would check in on the house and feed her cat. I went with my gran a few times, and the house was absolutely filled with quilted products like cushions and bedspreads, because the lady used to quilt. They were really beautiful. Although a semi now, this used to be a terrace. Between these two windows is where the door was, and it was a shoemaker's shop. There's a shoemaker living here. I won't go down Castle Avenue, but I will tell you a little about it. Where the road is, there used to be um, Mary Garden Lane and the field Mary Garden where some of the houses were built. On the right hand side of the lane was orchards and also the field and all the orchards were um, of course linked to cider making originally. This building used to house the post office before it was moved to the shop. Now we've come to the Royal Oak pub. I remember watching Morris dancers on the tarmac area here and seeing the horses and hounds of the local hunt. The Portman Hunt used to meet on Wednesdays in this part of the Blackmoor Vale and if at Oakford would meet outside either of the pubs for the pre-hunt sherries and things before going off to the planned field area for that day's hunting. There used to be wooden posts and railings outside um, and before it was modernised my dad used to go in as a child and the front door led through a stone slab passage to a small counter where he used to buy bottles of beer and take them to his granddad. It was also here that my father's grand's brother George Clark lodged when he came out of the navy. The passageway was incorporated into the bar um, when alterations were made. This is where the Skittle Alley was, at the back. We're now stood outside the village shop. It's called Ye Olde Bell Stores after the pub that was once this building. The shop is on the left hand side and the living quarters are on the right. Notice the phone box is green to match the colours of the local Pitt Rivers estate. This school was built in 1873 but it's much larger now with building at the rear. The left hand side of the door was for very young children who then went to the other classroom directly behind the door. My dad can't remember how many children there were but from the photos he would suggest there were about 30 in each class. Some children came down from Bell Chowwell where there was no school. The bell used to be rung just before the start of each school day to summon children and the bell rope came down at the end of the classroom. He thinks that they just walked to school on their own, and certainly when he got the beer from the pub at lunchtime, he walked down the road with the bottles on his own. There was of course no uniform to wear, and no clubs or activities like nowadays. There used to be a wall at the back with orchards behind there was an inter-school sports day, the Three Oakford Sports Day, with Shillingstone and Child Oakford schools. This was at different venues each year, my father thinks, but he can only remember the Oakford one down the wreck. At 11, children either went on to Sturminster Newton Secondary Modern School or to Blanford Grammar School. The grammar school had a cap, blazer and football kits that had school colours with the cap and blazer having three lines and the school motto, 
per ardua ad astra, which meant, with effort you can reach the stars. I remember when the corner of this building got knocked away by a lorry that had crashed into it. My gran said that the lorries weren't meant to be going down this road anyway. The man who lived here did thatching and was often sat in one of the thatched barns at the back making spars. To the left are now bungalows but these are built on cow stools and in the summer my father and others used to play cricket there when the cows were out in the fields and when the cows were there in the winter they used to muck them out and also brush and comb them to keep them clean. The fields for this farm were down Pound Lane at Stockfield and my father used to go with them sometimes for the milking. Other farmhouses down this side of the road also had cow stalls in their yards and fields further away. After Castle Farm there was another lane. Um, it was seldom used and always too wet to walk down. Now I will skip on to just before the wreck. This house opposite the wreck had been a carpenter's and the workshop on the side always housed footballs or cricket bats that you could walk in and pick up and go and play with on the wreck before returning the items later. Just past that house that incorporated a small orchard was this field that used to be allotments. They weren't small plots, just lines of Swedes and things, which my father said they hoed sometimes, and he thinks for just a couple of farmers. At one stage, he remembers that all hedge trimmings and other bits from the village were dumped there to make a bonfire for November the 5th, but doesn't recall that it burnt very well. The next field up was an orchard. The wreck was the scene of a fate each wit son, and of course the village football team uses it, the Butter Boys, named after the factory connection. I won't go any farther up this road, but on the right in the lay-by was another spot that the gypsies would stop in, and also a bit farther on the green on the left. The road now goes down to New Cross Gate, toll but used to be narrow right down to the main road and in fact ended at the far side of the present main road as can be seen by the old road being used as a lay-by. The main road was widened and the bottom of the hill dug out so that there was room to turn off the main road but this made the bottom bit extra steep. A bus had its brakes fail going down the hill and went across the road and tipped over on its side as it was unable to swerve and get onto the road opposite to Hamoon. My father thinks this was before the road alterations. Fortunately, there were no passengers on the bus at the time. This is the end of the tour, so I hope you enjoyed it. Over time, memories can become more difficult to recall, so apologies if there are any mistakes in this.